Good morning, everyone. Um, I usually send out the lessons just via email to the church members. If you did not receive that, they can uh, just pass that on to you. Just kind of nudge the person to the left or right of you, and they can just forward that to you. You know, starting off today, there are some things I was thinking about. There are some things in life that you can't see right away. That sometimes even when you are presented in a situation, you can't see the, the miracle that's going to happen right away. You don't, you don't see the good things that are going to come from it. Yeah. In the same way, there's sometimes you're all, uh, you, know, you love that day, you're, you're, you're having a great day, and you don't see the potential problems that are about to happen in your life. Sometimes you see some people and you don't see the friend that they can be. Oh. I know I remember one time back in high school, I had a friend who after I'd known for like a year, and he randomly just came to me. He's like, you know the first time I met you? I thought you were a complete jerk. <laughs> but now you're one of my best friends. I was like, oh, is this a compliment? I don't know. Like, but you know, in the beginning, he didn't see the friendship. There's even sometimes people always talk about it, love at first sight. It's not like that with everybody. Yeah. You know, it, it takes some time. It takes something. You gotta, you gotta look deep into it. Like, okay, I, I don't see it right away, but there's love that's gonna happen. See, in each of these things, we're talking about potential. Right? What something's potentially going to happen. And that takes insight. It takes, it takes a lot of different things. But potential is one of those things that it takes faith to see when you're looking at someone. It doesn't take any skill to see talent that they already have or ability. To see someone who's already producing, is that's easy to see. But potential is something that it takes faith to see in someone. Because potential is something that it's, it's not a now thing. It's not something that's happening right now. It's also not something that's promised in the future. It is something that's only reached by growth. That's potential. See, even now, like, I know just yesterday as a, um, excuse me, myself, Tegan, Jamie, and Jessica, we went and did some, like, rock climbing. I think it's called bouldering. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, you know, I, I, I walk in the, the, uh, the facility or whatever, and there's... So if you've ever done rock climbing, pretty much there's like things on the wall, climbing rocks and everything. Yeah. But they also have like this grading schedule or this grading kind of criteria up there. So what it is, is each different color, it kind of gets more gradual, harder, and difficult and everything. So it goes from orange and I believe all the way down to black or, or, or white. And when I first walked in there, I was like, this is nothing. I got this. <laughs> you know, I looked at those colors and I was like, I'm, I'm the rainbow today. Like, I got this. <laughs> this is me. But I really came right smack into how hard my potential was limited. <laughs> I did the orange, no problem. Blue, there, actually, to be honest, there's a big gap between orange and blue, like the next step. Like, it got drastically harder. Yeah. I did the blue, I did the purple, but I just could not do the green. The green was something that was extremely hard, but, you know, I, I hit that edge of my potential. But the thing is, it is not that I can never do it. I, there's still potential in me doing it. It's just, I really just won't put in the effort to do it. Now, I, I've reached the limit of where I'm willing to go. And see, when we talk about potential, it's one of those things where most people will start to say, I can't, when they really mean that they won't. Wow. See, have you ever saw potential in someone? Mm. Has anyone ever said that they saw potential in you? Even more, have you been surprised at the potential someone saw in you? Yep, it can be easy to see potential in someone else, but not so much in yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a bit difficult. It's kind of like you can even use an experiment when there's some questionable food choices over there. Mm. You see potential that your friend's going to eat it, right? You, <laughs> bro, you try it. You can eat it. But you don't see yourself eating it. There, there's a lack of potential you see in yourself. And again, it's just, it's just because what we do in our lives is we learn to stop short. We've learned again to say, I can't, when the real answer is, I won't. Is that, I, I won't try hard enough to reach that. I won't put enough effort into it. I won't change my mind or change my faith. Because it's easier to think that you can't. To think you can't means less pain or less pressure on yourself. Mm. Well, I've, I've reached the limit of my potential. What else can I do? I can't do it. I'm, I'm unable. But it's, it's not that. It's that you just won't put more effort into it to actually see it be done. 
And this isn't only just in life, but it also is attached to our spiritual things as well, spiritual life. See, what God sees in you and what you see in yourself are radically different, extremely different. See, God does not call us to the things that we can't do, but most of the times he calls us to things that we won't do. That we just don't want to try hard enough. Everything that God calls us to do, we are able to do or else he wouldn't call us to do it. So we're able, but we just won't make that extra step. See, God calls us to change the world. Right? He sees great potential in every single one of us. We are world changers. Where we look at ourselves and we're like, man, I'm just trying to wake up on my first alarm in the morning. I don't know if you've ever lived with people like Chris, um, who has 10 different <laughs> alarms. Uh, okay, he, he repented now. But, uh, you know, there are some people, I don't know if you do this, where you have, like, 10 different alarms to wake up in the morning. It goes, you know, 545, 547, 549, right? Yeah. It, it, it's difficult. That's how we look at ourselves. Like, change the world, God. I, I can't even wake up in the morning. Yeah. I'm still struggling not to eat cake before I go to sleep. Like, I mean, there's some... <laughs> There, there are some drastic steps, Father, that I, I need to make, but it's like, no, that's what God sees in us. Yeah. See, today we're going to look at the potential that we all have. We're going to look at the mission that each one of us has been given by God, and God seeing the potential that we can become. Today, the title of the sermon is called The Mission. Point number one is Jesus' mission. We're going to first look at what was Jesus' purpose and see what is the purpose and potential that he sees in yeah. each one of his disciples that chooses to follow him. So in Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. A very simple scripture. But this is, this is awesome because this is here said by Jesus. So many people have given Jesus a different voice and given him words that he's actually never said. They have put things into his mouth that Jesus has never actually said or never even had in his ministry. They'll say things like, Jesus says, just accept me. Jesus never says that. He says, follow. Yep. People will say, I have a personal relationship with God. Jesus told me to do that. No. He says, publicly show me off. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, well, I'm going to follow at my own pace. God knows. No. He says, drop everything. Keep up or drop out. Mm -hmm. Very different on what Jesus is saying. So Jesus here himself is saying that he left the glory of heaven to the gloom of earth. He came down. Why? He came down to bring people up. So that was his main purpose. He has come down from heaven to earth so that people can be brought. He, he's going out and seeking and saving the lost. He has given himself his own. He's like, my complete focus is to seek, to look after to travel far and wide to find those that are lost. Mm -hmm. Then once he has found the lost people, those that are hurt, people that have regrets in their life, those that would put up a fight, it says that he wants to save them. You, know, you must realize that that's, that's who we're looking for at first. That's who Jesus was looking for. That those that are lost, but they don't like it when people tell them that they have no idea where they are. That's the lost. That whenever you're lost, you don't like the idea of someone coming up and telling you, hey, do you know where you are? Do you know where you're going? See, some people are noticeably lost. You know, they, they obviously kind of looking around and everything. Yeah. But there are also people who play along as though they know where they're going. Oh, I know where I am. My, my relationship with God is okay. It's, it's okay. It's kind of like this. It's like, have you ever wished... That someone would help you out, but when they offered you help, you're too prideful to accept it. Yeah. That's all of us. Yeah. And that's the loss. That's what's going on in their heart. Even those, because there are so many lost people that are going to church today. Yeah. That's a difficult thing to say. Yeah. That people are going to church. They're there presenting themselves in a position to get help, but they just won't accept it when you present it to them. Because people have this misunderstanding about life. People try to deal with their problems as though they're trying to get groceries from the car to the, to the house. I don't know if you're like me, where you try and pick up every single bag that Bro. you can, you know, and make it your way to the house. That's like people and their problems. 
They're trying to pick up every little problem and wow. fight and just wow. struggle through life just trying to make it to heaven. Wow. Instead of just looking out to the left and the right, hey, can you help me carry this one? Mm-hmm. Yes, we can look and try and prove that the Bible does talk about scripture saying, hey, you have to sort out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. The Bible does say that. But a part of sorting that out is getting help. Yeah. yeah. That's a part of it. It's like a part of getting the groceries to the house is asking for help. Mm-hmm. A part of you getting to heaven and sorting out your fear and your trembling is asking for help. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't have enough fear. You need someone to instill that into you. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're not trembling at the cross. Your heart has gone a little bit hard. You need somebody to talk to you about it. See, Jesus was looking to find these people and then save them. He was looking for those that were out there, that they were lost, but they're kind of putting up a fight. Sometimes we don't understand that. We wish that it wasn't this way. That people were a bit more humble and love the fact that you're telling them that the relationship with God is a little bit terrible. They don't like that. But we're wishing that we find those people. Oh, man, I just want to go find those people that know that they're lost, that they're just going to love to come on it. No, that's not how it's going to be. That if they're lost, they're going to put up a fight. Yeah. And Jesus was saying, hey, I'm looking for those guys, the people that are hurt, the people that are messed up, the people who have lost their way a little bit, and I want to save them. Don't just want to find them and blame things and point what they're doing wrong. I, my main goal is to save them. And sometimes we can, we can lose that... We, we like the first bit. All right, we're going to go share our faith. We're going to go and do these things. But our main goal needs to be to save them, regardless of what it takes. And that's what Jesus' purpose was here. And we have to be willing to fight for those that we find that have the troubles in their life and the difficulties. See, Jesus did this, and he was willing to fight for those people. Even here we read of one of those people that Jesus did fight for. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. It says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The person who was reading this, and, and excuse me, writing this, was, was Paul. If you don't know who Paul is, he's the man who was called Saul. And he was out there pretty much leading Christians to their death. And now he's saying here that I, I am one of the worst, but Jesus has saved me. Yeah. What was awesome about this is Jesus saw potential in the persecutor. That he saw the Paul in the Saul. He saw that in him. See, Jesus didn't just find him. All right, he was lost and he was, he was doing the wrong things. But Jesus' main purpose was to go in there and change his life. Yeah. Not just to challenge him or introduce himself. <laughs> and this is a very important thing to understand. The measure where Jesus was willing to go to change people's lives. Why? Because so many Christians, excuse me, and churches will water down what it means to seek and save the lost. They'll water that down so much. Mm-hmm. It does not mean talking to your religious friends about God. Yeah. It does not mean simply inviting people to church. It does not mean writing a scripture on your social media page. That is not seeking and saving the lost. It is a purpose-filled life of actively going out there into the public and investing your life in others. That's what it means to seek and save the lost. To actively find somebody, hey, this person is off, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he doesn't have a relation with God, and I'm going to invest in him. I'm going to do whatever it takes him. To to, to bind up those wounds and get him to have a relationship with God. Because that's what Jesus' method was, right? He didn't just present himself in front of Saul and say, hey, you're doing what's wrong. No, he said, I I have a purpose for you. Mm -hmm. I I want you to go and do something. And that's the same thing what he calls us to do as well. In Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20, Chris read this before. It says, but therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. See, he, he, not only was Jesus doing this for himself, but he calls us all to do this as well. Sometimes people, again, will have this misconception about church and treat it as though it's a job fair. They'll come into church as though it's a job fair, see these potential different tents that they can have. 
oh, wow, what do I want to do? Well, this is going to be great. Where do I see myself serving in the church? You know, I can go there. I don't really like that tent over there. I don't, I don't know about that one. But over here, I, I, I'm, I'm down to do that one. Instead, it's more of understanding that when we show up, we have showed up to work and serve. Mm. This is not a job fair. This is, God, what do you want me to do? That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. See, when we become a part of the body of Christ, we do what the head tells us to do. That's it. Whatever the head says, the body does. And there, I'm pretty sure that there are some times that our body, our cells, are mad at our head. Right? Think about when you work out. I wonder what my arm is thinking. <laughs> what the heck am I doing this for? There's no purpose of lifting this up and down for no reason. This hurts. But the body is thinking, I'm making you stronger. Excuse me, the head's thinking that. It's kind of the same way. Where we're the body of Christ. And God has his motive and his reason. And we're like, God, why, why are you putting me through this? It's like, it's to make you strong. See, the job that Jesus is, is, is calling us to do here, it's not something that we can choose to pick or choose. It, it, it says here that God is giving us the job to have a world impact. Mm -hmm. To make all nations into disciples of Christ. Man, that's, that's a crazy job. That's a lot of potential God sees in us. Again, he sees his potential that we're able to go and do these things. Why? Because it's our purpose. That this is our calling. And it's not just for the minister or for some other people who potentially choose that tent in the, in the job fair. No, it's for every single one of us. And that's what Jesus was calling him, everyone to do. Is that he had this mission to go and seek him and save the lost. And if we're going to follow him, we have that mission as well. And we see here that Paul got saved. Well, did he accept this mission? Of course he did. In verse 20 through 24, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it says, However, Paul saying here, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying the good news of God's grace. See, here we see a man who was touched by God and knew nothing else but God's will. See, you haven't really fallen in love with God until you have fallen in line with God. Until you have gotten behind His mission and His motive for your life as well. It says His only aim. Everything else didn't really matter. His only aim and his only ambition was to finish the job. That's, that's, that's an awesome heart right there. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I can struggle with a heart where I just want to get it done and pat myself on the back and feel good about myself. I don't know if you've ever had those nights where it's like, my aim isn't really to go and find someone who's lost. My aim is to, I shared my faith so no one will say anything. Sometimes we have that on our hearts. But my aim is not to, I just want to finish the job. I want to do what's necessary. It's more of like, I just want to get the bare minimum. This was awesome that he got to see this, that, that I'm the worst sinner. And, and my only aim is just to go and find somebody else like that. See, Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. And now he has passed it down to us. We are talking about world evangelism, not just a fun community church. And to be honest, that's why most of us came out here as part starting this church. We could have stayed a Christian back in Sydney. We could have stayed a Christian back in America or where else any of us have come from. We did not come here so that we can be a Christian. We could have done that back there. But we did so because we were adopting Jesus' dream. Yeah. yeah. And when you start to forget that, you, when you forget about where of evangelism, you stop dreaming for yourself. You just, you, then you start settling for less. Again, you stop seeing that potential in yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stop short here. No word of evangelism, amen, all that's good, but I, I feel like I can still be a Christian back home. I can still be a Christian doing something else. But instead of still having that dream on our hearts. See, Paul faces challenges of achieving this dream. Even in his conversions, Acts 9, verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Remember, potential is only reached by growth. See, Paul had amazing potential, but he had to grow through the pain first. My first point 
In understanding my first challenge is, are you focused on world evangelism or just yourself? Where have you started to stop short in your dreams? So we see here that that was Jesus' dream, well, or Jesus' mission. What about our dream? What about our mission? Point number two, disciples' mission. Okay, so how important is this, right? How important is it that we accept Jesus' mission and do that even in our own lives? All right, well, let's read here in John chapter 15, 1 through 4. Jesus is teaching his disciples. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So Jesus here is talking to his disciples. He's already, hey, I've made you clean through my word and everything. But he starts presenting this um, kind of like an imagery here. He says, I am the vine, you guys are the branches, and God is the gardener. And what he's doing, he's looking at the vine, he's looking at the branches, and the first thing he's going to do, he's going to look at them, and he's going to inspect which branches are not bearing fruit. And he uses this word, he says in verse 2, he cuts off every branch that doesn't bear fruit. Meaning as he's looking at the vine, you can be the best looking branch in the world. You can have all the flowers. You can look nice. You can even do what branches do. You know, the little curve, try and get to the sun. Whatever, whatever. I don't know what you think of a good-looking branch to you. For me, it's one that I can climb. But, but you know, you can, you can be whatever branch. You can even be the, 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 the leader of other branches. Wow. Branches look up to you. You're the top of the tree. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If you're not bearing fruit, he says he will cut you off. Wow. So now we understand, well, bearing fruit, this is... Important to God. It's not just for us as a church. This is, this is important to God. This is a salvation issue. Because this is right after he says, talking about bearing fruit, he says, remain in me. This, this is connected. If we're remaining in him, we'll bear fruit. If we're not, we're not remaining in him. He sees this, this, is, this is entwined. If you're connected to the vine, you will bear fruit. Remaining him and him, uh, remaining in him and bearing fruit are important. So, I know I remember people even saying that um, if, excuse me, you are taking up too much space if you're not being fruitful. That's kind of how like God looks at the vine. You know, even on a tree, when one branch is overlaying another branch, you're, you're, you're taking up the sunlight that the tree can get. I remember a wise man said that another wise man said, you're not living on the edge, you are taking up too much space. See, even if you're fruitful, though, saying, okay, so he inspects the vine, those that are not fruitful, he's cutting off, but even if you're fruitful, you're still going to place, uh, face the blade. You're still going to get fruit. See, if your hearts are not pure and your motive is not focused on, I'm just here to bear fruit, you know, it's going to be a struggle. Why? Because you're going to ask people, well, why can't people just accept me? Mm. You know, why does everyone always have something to say? Why is everyone so, always talking about my, my, my failures? But when you have a heart that's set on doing your best, everything that you can, and after you did so, you ask, what can I do better to bear fruit? Then you'll be willing to be cut. Those that are just focused on getting the pats on their back and I'm doing enough, don't really care about being fruitful. Mm. Why? Because they're, they're, they're not focused on, on what it's about. See, why does God take this so intense? Mm -hmm. Why can't I just go at my own pace? Why can't, I just, why can't people just accept me? Well, first, it starts with misunderstanding the scripture. See, don't get caught up when people say that this fruit means the fruits of the spirit. I don't believe it does. It doesn't because fruits of the Spirit are not fruits for you to bear. Yeah. They are the Spirit's fruits. Right? And you can't focus on bearing the Spirit's fruit because that's the Spirit that's going to bear fruit on you. Now you can keep in line with the, the, the Spirit that He can start bearing fruit in you and bringing you through the process to get you to patience, love, and all these different things that He wants to bear in you. But those are not the fruits that, you are, that He's looking for you to bear. 
This group is talking about people. About helping someone else's life to become a Christian. And it doesn't mean just baptizing someone. It means helping and making them into a disciple of Jesus. See, some churches count their fruits or their members by those who show up on Sunday. That's not how God counts it. God counts their fruits and their members by those who show up on Monday. Those who show up and pray on Monday. That are reading their Bible. They're out there sharing their faith. Come on. That are out there actually actively going and seeking yeah. and saving the lost. You don't count your, 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 your members on Sunday. You count it on Monday. Mm. And see, that's what Jesus was talking about here. Going and bearing fruit is getting and investing in someone's life. See, there are so many Saul's out there that are waiting for someone to help them become a Paul. Where this starts messing up is when we start stop focusing on others, but only on ourselves. Do you think you're suffering because it's hard to share your faith? Mm. Because people are always challenging you or helping you just be a little bit more fruitful? Yeah. This is nothing compared to living a life without God. Mm. Right. A life without God. You know, when we're talking about being fruitful, we've actually just faced a couple months where we haven't been fruitful. And as a church leader, I can feel that pressure sometimes. Like, oh, we haven't been fruitful. It's been two months. I can feel like it's hard. Like, you know, we start to lose hope. That this is getting repetitive. Maybe we should try something different. I, I, I don't know. Should we try a different invite? I, I, I don't know. But I focus on myself and think, oh, this is difficult. But, you know, again, it's comparing my life to those that I'm reaching out to. And I'm blessed. I, I'm, I shouldn't be focused on myself. I should be focused on those that I want to save. Yeah. You know, I'm blessed. I'm not even talking about the money I have or relationships or anything else like that. Amen. I'm not even talking about the physical things. I'm talking about I'm just happy. You know, I have a relationship with God. I'm not plagued with the emptiness of God. Mm -hmm. uh, even just that, I'm like, my life is just so much better than everybody else. I'm not even looking at the physical things. See, we have to focus on the fruit and not on the labor. If you're worried and, man, you're focused on, I don't want to be pruned anymore, stop thinking about yourself. Mm. Think about those that you are reaching out to. Yeah. That's what Jesus was putting on our hearts. He continues on in verse 5 through 8. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Mm. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me and you are like the branch, you are like the branches that are thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Mm. Well, I, 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 this scripture when I was uh, doing this lesson or throughout this week, this one hit me hard. Mm. Because I've been putting out to the church um, just faithlessness. You've heard me say it over and over and over, guys. Man, I'm just looking for that one. Guys, we just got to find that one person. And I just realized reading this, I'm like, I do not have the will of God on my heart. He says here, you're going to bear much fruit. Much fruit. For me, I'm praying for one. I was like, what are you talking about? You, you don't see the potential that God sees. That there is so much fruit out there, Sean. I, it really hit my heart because I was like, I don't know, I, like you just get faithless, you know, when you don't see things happening. Yeah. But it's the thing is I stopped seeing the potential. Mm -hmm. I just want to see that one come in because I just like, this is getting too hard. But here it puts us on our hearts, guys, that we, there's so much fruit out there. Yeah. We just have to remain in the process. The process of seeing the potential through our patience. See, and it says here that the only way we're going to reach this much fruit is that if we remain in God. Have you ever tried doing spiritual things without the Spirit? It's the most depressing thing in the world. Have you ever prayed because you know you needed to pray, but you didn't want to be vulnerable to God? No. Yep. It's just a waste of your time, wasn't it? <laughs> Have you ever read the Bible without a willing heart to learn? Mm. It's just like, just went right over your head. It's depressing when you try to do spiritual things yeah. without God. Yeah. Have you ever tried sharing your faith without faith? Oh, wow. <laughs> 
And then someone says yes. It's like, oh, really? Like, dang, I gotta get this number now, you know? <laughs> but you're like, it says that we, we can't actually grow if we're not doing it with God. Yeah. So you get 10. Again, looking at this, potential is not a now thing. That this is something that we're gonna have to grow in and be patient with God to see that much fruit. Will you have the patience to reach your potential? So we see here that God is growing as he's talking about this. Is that, hey, it's important that each single one of us bears fruit or else we're getting cut off. And not only just bear some fruit, but we need to bear much fruit. And he continues on talking about this. He says, as a father has loved me, so I will love you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Yeah. I have told you this so, you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. No love has, uh, excuse me, no love, uh, excuse me, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I am no longer call you servants because, my, uh, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Mm. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. So that you may go and bear much fruit, fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Yeah. See, he continues on talking about how his love is going to be made complete in each one of us as we do his command. Mm. And he's let everything known to us now through the word of God and say, oh, this is simply what I want you to do. So you see, even, even talking about by the end of this chapter, some people will still go and say, well, I, I, I want to bear my own fruit. Mm. I don't want to do it the way Jesus wants me to do it. I, I want to look out and bear a different kind of fruit. Again, they're still looking at the church as like a job fair. I, I don't really want to go out and seek and save the lost that way. Well, hey amen. The Bible here is saying, yeah, you can do that. That's okay. Hey amen. We all have our choice. You just simply can't say and claim that you're connected to the vine. You go bear whatever fruit you want. You're just not connected to the vine. That's like a, a branch of an apple tree is saying, man, I'm tired of bearing apples. I just want to bear some of these. <laughs> Amen. Go whatever. <laughs> Cut yourself off from the tree then and go get connected to an, an orange tree. It's the same way. Okay, you're just not going to be connected to the apple tree anymore. Same thing. If we really want to claim to be connected to God, to his vine, and to Jesus, then we're going to bear the fruit that he's calling us to bear. Come on, Sean. And he says that he's appointed us to go and bear much fruit that is going to last. Yeah. This is awesome because it even got me even more faith. Throughout this lesson, I just started to gain more faith again. It's saying that this, that we're not only looking at people as fruit anymore. We're looking at them as potential trees now. That is, he's calling us to go and bear fruit. As we bear fruit, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to bear fruit. They're not a fruit anymore. They're a tree. They're a tree to be planted. And when this gets instilled in every person's heart, understanding that we're all there to become trees and bear much fruit, man, it catches on like a fire. That we can't stop the truth even if we wanted to. I love looking at it. You know, even just, even as, as a church, I know we can kind of look at each other in this small room and everything, but guys, the world is doing so much. The church is doing so much all around the world right now. Yeah. I want to always encourage you. I know the good news email can seem a bit long and yeah, but uh, amen, 50% is, is photos, so kind of take heart in that. But uh, <laughs> it's awesome when you read yeah, the good news yeah. email. What's going around? I don't know about you, but I was excited to hear of, of Samoa having their first baptism. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, that mission team started because of vis uh, visa issues. Yeah. <laughs> and now someone's life got changed. Yeah. That's exciting. See, people are trees. Yeah. Even my own conversion story. Mm -hmm. I remember it. So, my conversion story was pretty much, um, we had this friend that, uh, it was kind of like a friend of a friend of a friend, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, we had this friend that we would go and play Halo all the time together. And uh, this sister, now she's a sister, uh, I had a friend named Desiree, and she would play Halo with us. We would get together, play Halo and everything. This was years before, when I was like 16. 
And later on, she actually became a Christian. My brother was on the bus with her one day, and uh, they started talking, and she was like, yes, I go to church, and Eric thought he was super religious, never read the Bible before. But uh, he's like, whoa, yeah, that's awesome, I want to go to church too. My brother starts going to church, he gets baptized after, I think, three weeks of studying the Bible. It took me a while, but they reached out to me, six months later, I get baptized. My other friend, six months later, he gets baptized. My best friend since I've known from fourth grade, wow. he gets baptized, becomes a Christian. He goes all the way to Sao Paulo on a mission team. He baptizes and was part of one of the, um, the people that were studying the Bible with uh, Danilo, uh, who, who's a, a, a leader out there in Sao Paulo. Now he's leading a church where? Peru. Peru. And it's just like awesome. Like, man, Desiree was a tree. She started off and just affected everybody's lives. Wow. And that's who we're looking at and looking to, to uh, encourage. See, when people start to put that on their heart, they start living out Acts. I don't know how you can read Acts and not understand that this is our mission to go and seek and save the lost. Yeah. I'm not going to go through each one of these scriptures, but pretty much I just put throughout uh, Acts each scripture that just shows how people were going out there seeking and saving the lost. God was giving uh, uh, more and more people to be baptized. And by the end of it, in Colossians 1, 6 and 23, it reads this. It says here, that has all come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you've heard it. And truly understand God's grace. Dropping down to verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and you do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, that is pro proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and which I, Paul, have become a servant. We see here that that one person that, that Jesus saw potential in, Paul, beginning was that Saul, that lost person who was putting up a fight. Now he has become a servant. And has actually made it to where every creature heard the gospel. Wow, what potential. See, at the end of this lesson, I think there's just an old challenge for all of us. And this is something that I was encouraging myself and growing my faith as well. Is we need to stop thinking small. Whether that's the people around us or ourselves. You stopping short is hurting the world. We need to start praying for world evangelism. We need to start talking about what other mission team we're going to be going on. Yeah. You think, oh, hey, I'm already on a mission team. Yeah. Amen. Douglas and Monica thought that as well. <laughs> they're, 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 what mission team do you want to go? What, who else do you want to impact in this world? Oh, what is God. your kingdom dream? When's the last time you started talking about your kingdom dreams again? Mm. What do you want to start doing? Kingdom dreams is not one of those things that you've reached it. Okay, I'm done and gone. No, get another dream. Yeah. What else do you want in your life? See, I think... When we don't have the mission of Jesus on our hearts, we stop reaching our potential. Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage everyone this morning is start growing your faith again. Mm -hmm. Start talking about your kingdom dreams again. Let's not just think about, oh, wow, let's just bear that one more fruit. No, we're not talking about that anymore. We're out there bearing much fruit. Yeah. Yeah. We're out there looking for trees now. We're out there looking for people that can impact many, many others. Come with that, on. God, be you. Woo!